Welcome back to Nomad Boat Building. I'm Mark Rudin, and we are back building the Tahi Kayak. Now, the Tahi Kayak is a commercially produced composite interpretation of a traditional Greenlandic kayak form. What we're doing is we're using model making to try and reverse engineer that version of a Greenlandic kayak back to a wooden version of a Greenlandic kayak. There's a lot of people who like the Tahi kayak specifically, and so this is just kind of a fun way that you could build that kayak form yourself. Now I'm using model making techniques for doing this because building at scale is almost identical to building full size, and it just makes it easier for me to show you this process. Now these videos are intended to be a companion to some drawings that I have available on my website. These drawings are not intended to be prescriptive plans, they are documents that I've produced as I've gone through the process of trying to reverse engineer this design. And I invite you to purchase these drawings and take a crack at it yourself using both the drawings and these videos. Now in the last episode, we got the stems and keel attached to our gunnels, and now we're gonna take it right through to completion. Okay, so I've got the keel and stems attached. If you look closely here, I'm using these little Y lashings. Sorry, I didn't get those on video. There's not much to them though. Do a quick little explanation. So you've got three holes, obviously, and when you're lashing these, you can use the fact that it's a triangular configuration to your advantage. So in the case of this stem needing to be uptight against the stringer here, what you can do is you use, when you lash these, you do just the first leg, the leg that is going to pull this in this direction into here. So you can do that lashing first, that'll suck it up tight. And then you do the second lashing and cinch them off. And in fact, you could do both of them that way. So you do the first one, you don't tie off the first lashing, you just leave it loose, it's just friction that'll hold it. But uh, once you cinch them together, it all holds it together. And that works pretty darn good, actually. With those attached, you can attach your keel. But a, a great methodology is to temporarily attach them and then set your keel up on top of the stems and so you can mark your exact keel length. And then you could take the keel and stems off and assemble them separately. So you could drill and lash them together and then set the stems back up on the boat for the finished assembly because it will help to align them. Usually it'll align itself anyway. It's only because I glue it in the model and I glue it for convenience because it's too darn hard to try and do all this lashing with it unglued. Whereas in a full-size boat, it's a bit easier. Even in a full-size boat, I'll, ta I'll just tack it with a couple tiny dabs of hot glue. Once you've got this joint aligned, I throw a couple pegs in that are toenailed to hold it. And I usually throw on an extra lashing just for good measure. In this case, I put it on near the tail end of this because so that that's properly supported because you can't really peg down here where it's there's not as much wood down there to peg so that's why I put the lashing there. Round lashings are pretty straightforward but there's a bit of a trick to them. First we need to burn off the end of our sinew in order to form a little ball and then we form that into a simple slip knot. We pass our needle through our two holes through our slip knot bring that up tight and now we want to make sure that slip knot is sort of parked a little bit low there because it does get to be a bit of a bundle, but we want it exposed. We don't want to suck it up into the hole above. And that's because we're going to be finishing off the knot up against that slip knot. So three times through, like with all lashings. And once that's done, we'll start making off some half hitches around the whole bundle just above the slip knot. So that first slip knot now it acts as a stop for these next lashings. And that's what keeps the lashing tight. If you didn't tie it off above the slip knot, it would just be able to slowly undo over time. Now, would it do that? Who knows? But I like to sleep well at night. Now obviously this lashing is set into two holes buried because it uh, so it doesn't get worn away by accident. I don't do that with the ribs though. The ribs are one continuous lashing over the keel because it's uh, you can do it through the keel. It's a lot more work and you you would not want to do through the keel and a continuous lashing. I've done it. It 
it's just it takes a long time and once those are together you can fair off this guy a little bit so while it's in this state before i start to put ribs into it a great idea is to focus on at least getting this deck fared in together you don't have to attach the deck necessarily but you could because right now i can clamp it in a vise like this even the full-size boat, you could set up some sort of arrangement where you can clamp it so that this is nice and secure, and then it's easy to work on. Because otherwise, once it's ribbed, it, it, all it can do is sit in slings, and it just becomes a whole lot harder to hang on to it. All right, this is a completely ridiculous idea I just had. I was thinking, how can I make a vise that's heavy enough to hold the kayak for doing these, detailing these ends? And so... <laughs> I thought, I need something as heavy as my thickness planer to make this happen. So what I want to do now is just fare in this joint right here. I don't have a little thin piece of material that will represent the deck right now, but you can grab anything to sort of have a look and see if this will fare together, if you can spring something down into that shape and have it look good. That's looking like it's just about perfect. And there's just a slight hump right here at the bottom. Oh, other way, other way. There we go, that looks nice. This, yeah, this stock I have is almost thick enough, but just ever so slightly too thin. So I'll make up something different. This is a hand cut model maker's rasp. You can get it from Lee Valley Tools. Complete luxury, I'll admit that. I wouldn't say it necessarily does the job better than any other sort of file, but man, they sure are nice to use. I like that. 
Once again, we're using some Starbond cyanoacrylate adhesive to put this model together. You can support this channel by buying some product from Starbond. Follow the affiliate link in the description and use the coupon code NOMAD10 to get 10% off your purchase. I love this stuff. I think you will too. I always leave my decks a little oversized and then fare them in on the boat. It can be kind of deceiving to try and do it ahead of time. You think you get the lines right, but if you don't leave them oversized, you always end up cutting them undersized. The transition between the gunnels and the stem is always a little bit hard to anticipate as well, so that's another good reason to have a little extra meat there, a little wiggle room in order to get it all nice and fair. The deck is almost done. Now there's one more little detail here that's actually quite important. This just looks decorative, this little scallop I'm doing right at the edge of the deck, but it provides a landing for a stick that I use in my skinning process. And the stick runs down the length of the deck, it's temporary, and I cut a little tapered end onto it that lies into that scallop. And I use that stick in order to pin my cloth to it as I'm wrapping the cloth around the boat and forming my deck seam. When all is done, you simply yank the stick out, but the very tail end of it needs something to sit on, and that's what this little scallop provides. Plus, it just looks kind of cool. This is the first time I've tried these full-length decks, and I gotta say, I really like them. And now the last little finishing detail, we're just gonna round off the tips of the stems at both ends. Trying to finish off your skinning job right at the tips of the boat is easily the most difficult part of the whole skinning process, trying to come up with something that looks clean, that is. I have a trick where I take the upholstery piping I use in my seams and I bring it right down and wrap it around the tip of the stem, but it's always a bit of a crapshoot whether or not it works out properly. Finishing the deck this way at this stage in the process was so much easier than when I usually do it after the boat's framed that I will certainly be doing it this way moving forward. This is one of the really valuable things about model building is you get to have the experience of building a particular boat one more time without the expense of building a boat one more time or having a boat when you're done that you might have to store. Now that we have the decks on, the stems on, the keel on, we can move on to the next stage, which is framing the boat. All right, so this is my method of bending ribs. I'll move this pattern to the other side. I'll bend a few in and sort of try and hit it in the, uh, in the midships area. I'll try and park one at the quarters towards the ends. 
and then I'll use a batten in between. This batten's not quite as long as I'd like it to be, but it'll work fine. The batten should sort of stretch the full distance that we want the, the, the build stringers to run. And ideally have roughly the same attitude because that's the line that we're trying to affect is the, where the build stringer goes. So if you're got a boat where you think the build stringer is going to be more inboard, that's kind of where you want to put this batten. So with that in place, I just take a little piece of plastic. I got one end of it marked. And I use this to try and find the shape of the next rib. So I'll drop it in here with my marked end and I'll just push it in until it just touches my batten and then I'll mark it at the keel. Mark it on both sides. Take some of our rib stock, just lay that, make sure one end is squared up nicely. Put my marked end against the end. You got to be quite accurate with this. Then we flip it end for end and I align my center marks where the keel was. So when I'm done, I clip it off at the end. I always go a little proud of my line and then I tune it up with a chisel here. I'm not a full-size boat, I'm just, just chopping this off with a saw usually. And so we've got our little keel marks here. We want to make sure we preserve those. And when we do our bend, they go on the outside of the bend. And so I'm using a bending iron. Give my little rib a dip in the water. And ideally you've taken the corners off of this ahead of time. I've already done that, but I they're a little bit sharp because I decided these needed to be thinned out of here. So I lost some of my rounding in that thinning process. I think give a little another dip in the water. So these have been soaking for a couple of days. And I've got this little leather backing strap. And now generally I will start the bends from the ends, depending on the shape of the rib. So this rib has got to have a fairly tight bend near the end. So I'll take my rib and I'll leave a long overhang on one end and just start here on the side of the iron. I'll get the bend going and then I'll snake it around the iron. And I need it to be really tight bend right around there and it needs to be flat pretty flattish in the middle so I'll go end for end now do the same thing something like that now we want to get that into the boat while it's supple I'll fill in the blanks as I do this so this rib will go in. Sometimes you gotta tip it, weasel, weasel it in, and you massage it, massage it a little bit, pushing down a little in the middle, make sure it doesn't push the keel up. Try and get it fitting just so, so it's got a nice attitude. You might have to twist it a little to get it sit right. And if all's done well, it should be touching your stringer and touching your keel, not pushing the keel up. And that's a real danger if you don't massage this center down a little bit. And so I fill in the blanks like that. So the next, so when I'll come over here, and uh, ideally I'll try and do it so there's three ribs in between the, my first ones. I couldn't do it quite over here. So I'll do the one directly in the middle. And then I'll fill in the blanks after that. And that just helps to sort of keep the shape, keep control of the shape so you're not progressively pushing the shape in, into a weird direction. So we got the first piece of rib stock. I need to shave it down a few swipes. Put 
for the sake of models, this is not a terrible idea either because it's pretty common to have little funny looking dark specks show up on your rib sock as it's been soaking. It's just, I don't know, junk that's in your soaking container, usually dirt. Check that my edges still feel good. Having slightly rounded edges really makes a big difference in the finished model. And it makes a big difference when you're bending too, because it means that you're not gonna have the corners starting to break out on you. Let's see what this, how thick this is. 2.7 thousandths of an inch. Ooh. Now that all the ribs are bent in, I move on to lashing on the keel. Use a running lashing that laps over the keel, under the rib, over the keel, passes under the lashing, and then continues back over the rib and on to the next one. So for these models, I use the same sinew as for the real boat, but I uh, split it down smaller. Now, frankly, I should probably be using dental floss for this, but it's not quite as, um, there's not the stickiness to it that this stuff has. That's what makes this stuff nice to use for boats. Go under the rib over the stringer, under the string, pull it taut, back up and over the rib. That grabs the string and cinches it forward. So I lash the keel on before I do anything else here, and then I'm going to lash the stringers on. And what that's going to do is it's going to fare all the ribs in. So if there's any small discrepancies, hopefully it'll pull them into the shape we want. And then after that's done, then I'll fasten the ribs to the gunnels. Cause then you can get the odd rib that's kind of floating a little bit. And so we'll just let it float so that it stays nice and fair. If you want to know how much lashing material you need for doing these running lashings, you need one and a half times the length. I usually add a little extra, so if you go twice the length, you'll have plenty of extra. And when you do these lashings, this is when you sort of want to dial in your rib positions, because once you suck up tight on the lashing, they're not moving, not easily at least. So you might want to align them a little bit so they lie fair out of the, the keel, which means they'll kind of cant forward or back a hair, depending on where their position is. Ooh, I might just run a little short on this. Darn. Oh no, I got just enough. Just enough. Oh man. There we go. And that washing is done. Now over here on this end, I had a couple of ribs. My, my mortise placement was off because they, I, I don't know, I screwed up where how long my stem was gonna be. So I'm gonna go with, I don't often have to do this, but I decided I wanna add two more ribs because the, the uh, mortise is there. So we just lash them right to the side of the stem. Nothing wrong with that. I'll give them a drop of glue first, but I might just wait for this to dry because these ribs are all wet. So I'll leave it overnight. And lash those tomorrow, maybe. Now we need stringers. So these are made out of one by ones or three quarter inch square. So we want to put sort of a nice parabolic curve into the ends. It's just a taper, but it's not intended to be a dead flat taper. We just let it sort of a sweep out.
We usually take these down to the sort of the equivalent of about maybe a quarter of an inch at the end, so maybe even an eighth. Okay, and you might want to knock the corners off a little tiny bit. You could even round out the outsides, but you don't want to round out the insides. You want the insides to have as broad a foot so that they land uh, squarely on their ribs and, and can stand up there. All right, I got one stringer onto my liking, and so what I do next is I grab some dividers and I just pick a few spots along the length of the hull and carry the position of the of that stringer over from one side to the other. Well, like every two or three ribs or something like that. Okay, and I just match the longitudinal position to the other side. And then I usually start in the middle and I usually use quick grip clips quick grip clamps to clamp them all in place. Of course, I don't have, I only got a couple of those in this size, so I'll use these guys. So just start clamping at the spots where I took measurements. Then you take a close look at whether or not you it looks even. So sometimes the carrying the mark over isn't 100% accurate. I can see that I'm a little short on this end. So before I go too far, and my hammer or whatever serves as a hammer and just give it a little tap. Just leave the clamps in place and start lashing. On this boat, however, we're going to use some uh, CA glue to tack all of these in place because it's too hard to try and lash it in place at this scale without the stringer fastened in there already in some fashion. worry about the very ends because sometimes I, I'll sometimes whittle down the uh, stringer a little bit so it fits a bit better. Just worried about the ribs. Okay, so with that done, I'm just going to throw a little drop in. Okay, so I'll just leave that to set up for a bit, and then we'll come back and we'll lash it just like I did with the keel. Now it's when I have to start lashing anything that the process of model making is not faster than building the real thing. I can lash up a real stringer far, far faster than I can lash up a model. It's just so fiddly trying to stuff my big uh, sandwich clamps into these tiny little spaces. But the benefits of model making far outweigh the shortcomings of it. So we're using the same running lashing that we used on the keel. The sinew passes under a rib, over a stringer, under the rib, over the stringer, and then it goes under itself. And this is important because now we haul it tight and we pass our bundle back up and over the rib and now when you go to the next rib it's going to haul that knot nice and tight and it's going to create this really nice flexible yet tight running lashing what really helps to make this a good lashing is the lashing material you use so this synthetic sinew that i use which is made out of nylon is really nice and stretchy and that allows these lashings to come up nice and tight and hold themselves tight when you use a non-stretchable material like a polyester, it just doesn't do this job nearly as well. When you break a line, in this case, I think it's my knot that just came undone. It is, yeah. So, 
should be doing a different knot, but do a square knot. Okay, leave some tails. It could be a, a you could just double it over, do an overhand or a figure eight knot. Put that down a bit. I'm gonna melt the ends off a bit. Give them a second to cool. You pull that tight. Might sometimes it'll leave a little nerble like that, but huh, that's what we do in the real boat. So that's what we do in this one. I try to make it a continuous lashing without an extra knot, but sometimes you can't avoid it. It's not the end of the world. Next, we add the deck stringers. I make these out of three quarter inch thick material and they taper from about an inch to an inch and a quarter at the midships area down to maybe about three eighths or half an inch thick at the very tip. And I let the tips project down below the shear line. They lie on top of that forward deck beam. And the idea is that the skin will depress this deck stringer down and create a nice fair sweep from the massic down to the deck. Of course you need to leave enough room between the deck stringer and the gunnels for your knees. That's where your knees usually sit. I'll use dowels to pin these to the knee brace and we'll just lash them down at that forward deck beam. Alright, well we got our cockpit hoop roughed out here. I built it exactly like I do the full size one. Start with uh, normally an inch and a half lamination, but it's going to come down to about an inch and a quarter by the time you're done. And uh, two half inch wide by quarter inch thick laminations to create a half, half by half lip, though these are a little over width. I usually scarf the main hoop at the back, although it's a little easier to scarf on one side. Then I'll stagger one of the uh, lip laminations off to one side because it's just easier where it's a gentler curve and then I'll but I'll put the last one across the back here for the models I'm using Gorilla glue Actually, it'd be a good thing to use for the real thing too because uh, This is it's one of the few adhesives you can use while the wood is kind of damp You know fresh out of a steam box or especially if it's been soaked But I hate using the stuff because it's just this messy slimy garbage and uh and the foam, the filling properties of the foam is, well, it does fill a hole. It doesn't do a good job of filling a hole, not like epoxy does. So I typically don't use it that much. I'll usually use G-Flex for gluing these on in a real boat because G-Flex can hang on to damp wood as well. So uh, now I'm just going to clean this up on the belt sander. I'll just, uh, when I do these, I glue them up in, in layers. So I'll do the first one, glue it up, clean it off. And the way I do these scarves these days is I only scarf one end. I let the other end run wild, full thickness. After it's glued, then I come back and I sand it down to a consistent thickness. So the inside gets the scarf and the outside is just left full. You can see on the edge here, I've just whittled this off with a knife, but this was formerly sticking out full thickness, hanging out to, uh, like a tail. So I'm gonna to go to the uh, belt sander and I'll just whoosh, clean that up. Now the trick to clean up all this stuff. That's a lot more difficult. This is something to, handy to have around the shop. It's just some MDF. I've got a bunch of pieces of MDF with full sheets of sandpaper on both sides. So they'll be an 80 grit, 125 or 120, something like that. I go all the way up through the uh, grits. It's 
got about three or four of these kicking around and they're good for obviously leveling small parts but here i just want to hang on to a small part for doing this this trimming operation and the sandpaper really helps out if i were trying to do this just on the bench top this thing would be skidding all over the place So there we are, we're at the other end, just as I described. Now I hope you enjoyed that. Now remember, I do have a set of drawings that shows you a bunch of the details of a framework like this, lines of the Tahi and a few other things that will help to guide you through the process. Now this is not intended for the first time builder of skin on frame boats per se. I expect that you have already a working knowledge of building skin on frame boats when you uh, go to use this stuff so that you can see where I've um, not necessarily given you the best roadmap to where you want to go. As I say, they're just kind of quick and dirty sketches of, of things. But um, if you are a new builder or want to be a new builder, I recommend you either get a book specifically on building skin on frame boats, and there's a number of them out there. Or if you'd like a video course that would walk you through it, then I recommend you go to Cape Falcon Kayaks or Brian Schultz has, and Liz have put together an incredible detailed series of videos and drawings and plans to produce Greenland style kayaks and other boats. Um, and there's nothing left to the imagination. Everything is spelled out for you very, very clearly. So go to Cape Falcon Kayaks for that. Otherwise, go to my website if you want to roll the dice and just try stuff out and have some fun. Now, purchasing the drawings is a great way to support these videos in general, but you don't specifically need them to build a Greenlandic kayak. These videos contain all the elements that I use to build these kayaks without plans using traditional anthropometric methodology. Watch the videos again, take notes, and you'll note that I've got all the little elements that I use step by step through the whole video series. The only thing I haven't given you up until now is the overall length of the boat, which is nominally about three arm spans, and the overall beam of the boat, which is nominally about your hips plus your fists to the inside of the gunnels. Beyond that, I've given you all the answers, so take a crack at it on your own. I do encourage you to build at scale before trying to build full size, and even going to half scale, half size, is a real learning experience that is very, very valuable 
and will help you be that much more successful at building the full size thing. All right, thanks for watching this series. I hope you enjoyed it. Now I want to remind you that these videos are supported by my followers on Patreon. So if you can help me out on Patreon, I'd really appreciate that. You can find links in the corner or down in the description.